Hi, I'm Brooke, a coach at MeetRx, and I'm here today with Anna, also a coach at MeetRx. Hi, Anna, how are you? Hello, Brooke. I'm very well indeed. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And thank you for uh, taking this time to share with us your story and your, you know, your route with the carnivore diet. So how's it been for you? What was it like before you started eating carnivore? Uh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was um, it was forty three years of uh, bewilderment, really, because I thought I was doing everything right. I mean, my um, my entire family went vegetarian when I was about five years old, and uh, not that long after that, we also became vegan as well. And um, of course, there was so much literature even available even at that point talking about how heinous animal foods were, how terrible saturated fat was, um, how the best thing for us to do was to cut these things out of our diet completely, which of course we had, and, and that supposedly eating lots of grains and beans and vegetables was gonna keep us healthy. And we ate shed loads of things and we got sicker and sicker and sicker. So one of the, um, one of the kind of catchphrases that I hear a lot from from people who still eat plant-based diets, you know, if you if you criticise a diet, if you talk about the problems you've had, they will say, "Oh, well, you do you weren't doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't combining your foods right, you know, in the correct way, or you weren't um, you know you should have been having this superfood or that kind of particular vegetable or something." But we tried everything and i mean everything i was always experimenting trying to find that um that philosopher's stone you know that magic bullet that was somehow going to make it all all right but as the years went by and i was a very healthy little girl when we became vegetarian but as the years went by i just got sicker and sicker and sicker and um I mean, quite serious things as well. Things that are not supposed to happen in the West. I, I had very, I had mild rickets when I was a child, um, which wasn't even picked up. It's just pretty obvious from kind of photographs of before and after, basically, what was actually happening. And I developed chronic candida, and um, I had like constant kind of you know earaches and things this is when I was very young and then I had a com almost a complete physical collapse when I was about 16 um, my period stopped uh, my hormones were all over the place I was depressed I was exhausted my my weight was I was really struggling to keep my weight down because I became hypothyroid you know as a teenager um, and everything was a struggle and then my digestion began to seriously deteriorate and then just got worse and worse and worse over the decades and as a response to that i just had to keep out on cutting out more and more food groups because i just could not cope with food and um by the time i was in my 40s i could only really cope with vegetables when i say cope it was all relatively speaking and um spirulina <laughs> and i i ate huge quantities of both um i was perpetually hungry perpetually cold <laughs> perpetually tired um i was hey, sorry and you still were vegetarian then. i was still vegan Oh, vegan, yeah. but at that point it was no longer from choice because I couldn't digest eggs or milk or any of these things I'd had to stop having most carbohydrates because my my candida was so severe I could not keep it under control I mean I'd long since stopped having any kind of sugar in my diet I mean that that all stopped when I was a teenager and actually I think that was pretty much the saving grace because I think if I'd had sugars or you know in large quantities on top of what I was eating I think I would have been a lot sicker a lot quicker but um, of course as we know sugar is absolutely terrible I mean, particularly in its refined form so that was one big you know thing that I had absolutely in my favor going for me also, I stopped drinking as well when I was very 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 young what were you eating yes it's, it's good that you weren't eating the sugar at least you didn't get yeah. diabetes yes but 
what were you eating? I was just eating loads of vegetables. I mean, because it's the thing, because I was hypothyroid, I really struggled to keep my weight down. And for many, many years, it, I mean, it really is just quite extraordinary that I was able to keep going to the extent that I did because I was hardly eating anything. I mean, my calorific intake was, was puny, paltry, really. And, um, but I was, a, I was a kind of freak of physics because I managed to hold down jobs for most of this time, exercise, yeah. have a social life to a degree, although that was a struggle because I was always cancelling my poor friends you know, at the last minute because I had so many problems. And um, Were you eating nuts? nuts I was eating, eating handfuls of nuts, but I was very, very fat intolerant, actually. Because, of course, that was one of the problems, as I now realise, the, the severe lack of zinc in my diet um, had a very, very deleterious effect on my um, horm no, the enzyme production within the digestive system. So, and, and also the bile production just shrank to almost nothing. So I, I had a severe problem with digesting any fats at all. So it was more or less a fat-free diet, which we now know, of course, is staggeringly unhealthy. And it was just shed loads of vegetables and and really just spirulina. Wow. Yeah. And and of course, what we know now, what I know rather, in my ignorance, I didn't know then, was that I was completely unable to um, utilize many of the nutrients that were actually in the spirulina because they weren't in the right form for the human body. So I was chronically anemic without knowing. And of course, you know, severe anemia has all sorts of um, negative health ramifications. So I was constantly thirsty. I, mean, I was drinking and drinking and drinking all day long. I mean, it's quite amazing that I didn't do more damage to myself just you know, simply through that. And maybe the spirulina I, was the only saving. I think it was that and the, and the lack of sugar as well, you know. Um, and, um, Yes, it, it, it was it was really difficult. I mean, you know, fortunately, I'm actually quite quite a tough nut and quite a cheerful person inherently. So I was because it, this because this happened kind of I say gradually, but actually there were times when my health did deteriorate quite severely in jumps and, and stages. But most of the time, it was quite a steady deterioration over a long period of time. And I think that kind of experience does acclimatize you to the experience of poor health. You just get used to doing less and less or expecting less of yourself. I mean, I didn't, you know, because I got so ill so early, I was really like a little old lady when I was kind of in my late teens. Um, what, and, other, what other physical symptoms did you have? Oh, okay, well, I'll run through the list. Obviously severe digestive issues, which just got worse and worse and worse. And when I say severe, pain, irritation. So it would not be unusual for me to be up all night without any sleep at all. And then I'd have to get up and go to work the next day. So I, I cannot tell you how many times I did that. I just got very, very good at coping. And, um, and sometimes that would go on for days and days and days and end. I think there were a few times where I just basically didn't sleep for several weeks because I was just not able to know my stomach was playing up and of course once you get into that pattern and your body is so tired of course the digestion then deteriorates even more so it's a very difficult cycle to get into so there were the dis digestive issues um all sorts of kind of minor things like I had kind of burps on my skin on my body um which are probably kind of vitamin d kind of zinc related I know it's all gone now um I had very, very dry skin and hair, you know, scaly kind of skin, particularly on my legs. Um, long periods of time, I wasn't able to menstruate. Um, and actually, I had menopause really early. And I'm sure that is to do with what was going on. I mean, I was, I was, I'm 50 now. I was through the menopause about five years ago. That, that's early. That's right. Yeah. Um, my eyesight was not good. That deteriorated when I was a kid. Uh, my teeth, it wrecked my teeth 
I had to have so much dental work done. Um, oh, what else? I was yellow. I mean, I was a really severe yellow color. It was, I had people coming up to me in the street sometimes asking me why I was yellow. <laughs> which is really embarrassing and people just assume that I was tanned a lot of the time as well they'd ask me where I'd been on holiday but it was just this perma perma jaundice that wasn't really jaundice and uh, what else what else I, had, I did actually make a list because there's just so many things I just forget them. brain fog oh, I had the most terrific brain fog when I was doing my A-levels um, when I was kind of late teens sometimes I'd have to read the same the same sentence in a in one of my textbooks like maybe 10 20 times because my brain was so fogged up i was really struggling um god only knows how i got through these things you know you, you just cope um yeah i mentioned tiredness water retention particularly my lower body i used to really really swell up very badly uh particularly as the day went on um i, I think that was to do with copper toxicity which of course is a phenomenon associated with vegetarian vegan diets where you are not imbibing enough zinc and as a result the copper levels in your body begin to rise and rise and rise and of course so many of the foods i was eating were copper rich anyway so not having the zinc coming in to balance that out meant the copper was building up in my system um, i had pretty severe hyperglycemia um, and that would kind of bring mood swings and so on. I mean, I was depressed for large stages of my life, actually. Um, I would probably say the bulk of my adult life up until I was about 36, I think I stopped, I stopped being depressed then, but certainly a long time. Um, oh, I couldn't sleep through the night. It was just impossible. I'd have to get up and drink and pee several times. And I'd be thirsty, 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 you know. So I could not go for a length of time without that. I was losing my hair. Um, I mean, this is all kind of standard stuff. I mean, I, I bet if we spoke to any carnivore, you know, most of them would, would have these kind of issues. Um, I was starting to get grey hair as well, which has kind of stopped and reversed. Yes. Did, you, is, did you ever see a physician? during this time or i went to see a doctor in 1989 i was living up in manchester and she wanted she wanted to take me um me to go into hospital and i said well what are they going to do and she said well they'll flood your body with lots of chemicals and see how you react she actually said that to me <laughs> <laughs> and i just scuttled out of the kind of waiting you know, her surgery as quick as I could and never went back to a doctor basically but um I, actually th that's not quite true because the last experience I had of a doctor was 2013 and I had my uh, my IUD my coil taken out by my doctor and I was quite curious to see what what it would look like because it had actually been inside me for quite a long time at that stage and um and I insisted on sitting up and having a look, even though he didn't want me to. And there were coils of candida wrapped around this IUD, like rope. Oh my goodness. Did you yeah. know what that was? At yes, that I did. did. Yes, did. I did. Because actually, and this is, this is like a kind of whole other ball game. And I, I, I'd be interested to know how many, how many of the people who come to, particularly the women who come to carnivore, have had candida problems because that was the, the time when I went to the doctor to have the IUD taken out. I was in the midst of a huge detox from candida. I decided to stop having nuts because I had been having a few nuts at that point. I decided to stop having them and see what happened. This was around about yeah, 2013. And suddenly I began shedding candida and it was coming out of me like you wouldn't believe. And when I say it was handfuls in the toilet bowl, I, I'm not exaggerating. I must have been absolutely stuffed full of candida from here to, you know. Wow. There's so many ways we can screw it up with, with the diet. Yeah. I mean, I knew I had a candida problem, but my God, I had a candida problem. Like, I didn't think it was possible. I mean, it's just amazing. And it was, a lot of it was thick and white and rubbery and obviously had been inside me for a very long time. So um, getting that out of my system was like the kind of beginning because I was, you know, obviously it was, it was still a few years before I reintroduced meat and went carnivore. But, 
it was a big turning point and I did begin to start feeling better when I was finally and it was actually getting rid of the nuts that really made the difference yeah nuts and seeds my mother has just added nuts and seeds so uh, uh that was um so when did that happen? When did that great awakening happen for you? Oh, well, I think I, I had a very, have a very dear friend and he'd walk much a, a, a similar path to, to people like you and me. Um, he'd been through, uh, he tried everything. You know, he'd been vegan, he'd been raw vegan, he'd been fruitarian, he'd been, I think he'd done, he'd, done, he'd tried everything, you know, and he'd acquired a lot of knowledge along the way. And then he reintroduced meat. And he was the one who told me about um, the work that a guy called Dr. Wilson does with copper toxic patients. And so he would talk to me about copper toxicity. And this is not something I, that actually ever come into my purview. And that interested me in itself because I was so arrogant. You know, I, th I thought I knew it all about diet. You know, I thought I'd researched everything. You know, there was nothing that anyone could tell me. And then suddenly Jamie was telling me about, you know, copper okay all right you know so I did a little bit of reading and that got me thinking and I think at that point you know that seed being planted I always knew that at some point I was going to reintroduce meat but it took me a while to pick up my courage it's only because my misconception at that stage was that if I introduced meat that I would have a tough time actually um, digesting it because of course my digestion was so poor you know it 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 made sense so I waited a while and then I started eating meat again about, yeah, it would have been about four years later. And, um, and this is not that long before, obviously, we went carnival. And I, I remember because because it was actually quite difficult for me psychologically. I think a lot of people who go back to eating meat have no problems with this whatsoever because they've probably been salivating over bacon for the least the last 10 years or something similar. But I did not have that experience and I had to acclimatize myself to meat and the way I did that I was I'd go online and I'd look at pictures of meat and I kind of get my head around yeah you're gonna eat this you're gonna eat this stuff but this flesh so eventually I plucked up the courage to eat some chicken and within a very short while we were eating it every day and eating more and more and at that stage I really began to start feeling a lot better and it was it was it was pretty immediate really yeah there was instantaneous reaction I just felt oh, this is what my body wants you know because initially when I when I started eating meat again I thought that it would just be maybe an occasional thing but soon it was every day well, wait, and, wait a second. I'm curious did you was there a a, a bridge like with eggs and dairy and cheese before oh, we did yeah we did eat that we did eat eggs actually for a while beforehand yeah dairy i tried but i just can't i just i still can't so i think my body's going to have to heal quite a lot more before um i can reintroduce dairy but although that would be an aspiration because it would be lovely you know but um it's not feasible at the moment but what I will say is that I never had any digestive problems with the meat whatsoever. And, and pretty soon it became apparent that it wasn't the meat that I was struggling with. It was vegetables. Yeah. Yes. And of course, at this stage, I was building up my knowledge because I was listening to podcasts with, as we were mentioning earlier, you know, the marvelous, the marvelous Peterson family, uh, Michaela and, and Jordan, you know, to whom I owe everything. And, um, and of course there was that, you know, very, very famous interview with Joe Rogan, which was hugely informative. And then I was just researching and finding more and more information. And it took a few months for me to take the plunge, but I finally did in July, 2018 and, and I haven't looked back basically. It's just been, and I think what really amazed me, well, so many things amazed me, but, one thing that really amazed me is that I didn't miss anything from my diet, my previous diet. I didn't, I, I've never wanted to eat another vegetable. I've complete, when I think about sweet food now, you know, carbohydrate dense food, I actually feel quite repulsed. And you weren't eating grains at this time when you No, were I wasn't. I'd love to eat that. Grain. Yeah, I mean, I stopped having grains probably around about 2008 because I could tell just they weren't doing me any good 
So there was, there was a certain kind of, you know, a certain number of stages that were happening during this time, you know, relinquishing kind of normality, I suppose. Well, for a long, you know, it's been a very, very long time since I've had anything approaching normality. And I think in a way that made carnivory easier for me to embrace because it was just, oh, well, just another weird diet. Well, what's yeah. new? <laughs> you must have noticed such a difference with digestion and bloating to just Amazing. be living on vegetables and then not have to eat vegetables. It must yeah. have been a huge difference. Huge difference because of course the bloating had always, well, such a, for a long time been such a tremendous problem and it just disappeared. That was it. In fact, you know, it hasn't really come back since. And, um, I mean, okay, the other, the other thing I really noticed, of course, was, was mood improvement, which happened, again, very dramatically. Suddenly I felt this, you know, <laughs> by, pervaded by this kind of zen stillness, really. Felt so much calmer and happier. Yeah. And your sleep? Did your sleep improve? I mean, yes. Oh, yes dramatic improvement and that is still um the improvement is progressing um because of course i was coming from such a low base not i probably had not had an uninterrupted night's sleep since i was a young teenager at, you know up until this point and now i would say that probably um 50 of my nights i sleep through and it's getting better all the time that's good so, so let's run down the list of all oh, the wonderful Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. The wonderful list. Okay. Well, the, uh, the, as I said, mood improvement, that held huge, huge change. Um, the yellow skin, that was very interesting. Orange. orange, my mother just said. Yes, I was orange. Not really. Yet. Yellow isn't extreme enough. Um, I, I, I know. It was very odd the way it happened, basically. Um, obviously, I went carnivore. And for about two months after that, the orange actually got worse. It's, it, it's, it's exaggerated. And I was this kind of neon colour, actually, for a while. And then it just went. And I, I suspect that what was happening was that the, the copper, which of course is kind of, cause copper causes yellowness basically in the in the skin it's, it's a symptom of copper toxicity and i was clearly copper toxic and i think the copper which was probably secreted all around my body because it gets deposited everywhere but particularly the liver and the brain um was probably coming into my bloodstream you know the, the most um you know the most immediate kind of stores of it and um in the short run actually making me more yellow more orange and then it just went, well, it didn't go completely because what would happen is that I, every periodically I would have a surge of yellow again, which so may similar last. To, similar to maybe oxalate dumping. Which exactly. Is a pattern of surges. Yes, intermittent surges, exactly. And then I might have like an hour of looking a bit yellow or sometimes it might last a day or so or something. And then it would, then it would tail off again, go away. And it's those really episodes, fun. Sorry. During these times, I'm curious, during those surges, or uh, did you notice more brain fog then? Um, no, not more brain fog, but I did get um, uh, physical symptoms in my intestines. Uh -huh. because, again, that is associated with copper toxicity. You get irritation in the intestines because it, what, the main route through which it comes out of the body is in the bile. So obviously <laughs> straight through the, yeah. So I would, you know, I would get some irritation, maybe kind of the odd sleepless night, you know, as, as, the, as the copper came out of me. And, and, and I, would, I would call them my copper attacks because they wouldn't last for very long. And of course, what, what has happened over the last few years is that now I, heart, I mean, I can't remember the last time I had a copper surge. Actually. Oh, good. And yeah. at this time you were a carnivore, you were eating meat, yeah. mostly meat, yeah. and then you I would, would have these discharges. Yes. Now it's most unfortunate because I, I now know, you see, you know, it's, it, unfortunately knowledge is not something that comes to us in, in, in kind of hundred percent what, you know, it, it gets dribbled out over time. And one of the things I didn't know about for a long time, even when I was carnival was histamine intolerance, which I most definitely am. And the first kind of year or so that I was carnival, I was, I had a job lecturing in, in London and I was living up in Shropshire, which is quite a distance from London. And I was having to commute between Shropshire and London to do my, 
to do my work, you know, for, for three terms a year, only for a couple of days a week, but, you know, even so. And which was dire anyway, as you can imagine, you know, not much fun. Because being a carnivore, there was nothing I could eat apart from tinned fish. And now I know that, you know, being histamine intolerant, I really shouldn't have been eating tinned fish. So I was actually aggravating my stomach problem, even whilst I was getting better, you know, in general from, from being a carnivore. So I could never really understand why I'd feel great during the week. And then I go up to London and I'd have sleepless nights again and feel rough. <laughs> so, but it obviously it was the fish. And I think that a lot of carnivores are, might well be in the same situation as I was in without necessarily understanding you know why why you know so because it's not just tin fish of course pork also has um disproportionately high um history histamine content as and does bacon wild. yes yeah, wild, yeah wild game anything smoked anything that's hung um for a long period of time so i have to be very very careful i can't eat pork um i think and, and i think um people have found that it changes it changes you heal and it changes over time yeah i anticipate this well i anticipate yeah. this well i mean i'm very very hopeful that because it has got so much better why why wouldn't that carry on mm -hmm. so um how do i get onto this oh yes i was talking about that, the copper attacks now you mentioned oxalates earlier on and i really should talk about that because that is such an important part of my story because i do have a very very hefty oxalate oxalate overload um can you just imagine all the vegetables that you've been eating oh diet for your entire life i mean you, you should see i mean i think my mother and i would would eat more vegetables in a week than most families of four would probably eat in several months like we we just i mean we spent a fortune i mean you no know, not just obviously on the vegetables because it was all organic as well but but you know the the, the superfoods yeah. you know the, the spirulina and so on i mean we, we were spending hundreds of pounds a month i, I mean I were you supplementing were you taking b vitamins and uh protein no because i thought that i was going to get everything i needed from the spirulina in my again in my innocence now of course i was chronically short of b vitamins I mean, I was chronically short of everything, I'm sure. I must have been deficient in pretty much everything. Um, I mean, it really is quite miracle, a miracle that I, was, I, was, that I wasn't much, much sicker. Much sicker. You mentioned your mom, and I know that she's there. She's kind of sounds like you have a good cheerleader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. She's got her own story to tell, actually. I mean... It, it, and she's also eating meat. Yes, yes. We both went carnivore at the same time. Well, not quite. I was six days ahead of her. And now my sister has also joined us in the last few months. That's so fun. there's now three out of four in, in the nuclear family. And my poor father is now the odd one out, you know, which is ironic because he was the first person out of the four of us to actually abandon vegetarianism, you know, when I was when I was much, much younger, but I think he's too attached to his potatoes and his carbohydrates to, to but, but he eats meat, it sounds like. He does, he does, he does. And I and I he will deny it, but I think he's eating more since we have, you know, changed it and obviously he could see how I mean I remember the first particularly the first six months, he would look at me and he would say, My God, I can't believe how well you look compared to oh. That's yeah. so fun. That's yeah, so fun. it really made such a difference to and, and to my mother as well because she certain times in my life she thought I was going to die. She was so worried about me. So worried about me. So um yeah, I, I feel terribly for for um people who are getting into this who have children who have been you know have been sickened by poor diets, uh vaccine exposure um you know uh pharmaceutical kind of like poisoning of various kinds um because as to watch your child be sick and not really understand and think you're doing the best thing for them yes absolutely is a terrible thing a really terrible thing what else in terms of symptoms have got better well the water retention has definitely got a lot better uh, my skin and hair so much less dry um i don't bother with putting skin conditions. Is beautiful your beautiful skin <laughs> yeah i don't get spots anymore and, and i've stopped putting conditioner on my hair 
and you know my hair used to be just so dry it was ridiculous um sleep we've mentioned tiredness i can keep going for hours and hours and hours you know i don't really and i and as we were saying earlier on i sleep so well um, my hypothyroidism has dramatically improved i don't feel anywhere near as cold as i used to i was just so freezing cold all the time um that's still i would say that's probably about 60 70 percent better but you know it's still it's still early days really um and, and oh it's two almost two years for you not under, almost two years yeah two years in july um one really important thing i, I did mention earlier on that i really s struggled with fat digestion and for a long long time when we started being carnivore i was actually taking bar tablets um, because I just could obviously just wasn't producing my own bile or at least not sufficient quantities of it and just recently in the last kind of few weeks I've stopped taking the bile tablets and I seem to be absolutely fine without them so the bile production has now kicked in properly so that's a that's a huge improvement um, I'm not thirsty anymore I can go for hours now without drinking you know in a kind of normal way um, Oh, what else? I'm not hyperglycemic. I, I I do intermittent fasting. I just have two meals a day now, which I think is routine for most carnivores. Um, what, what, what are you eating these days? I eat predominantly beef. Yeah, I, I, I do think Michaela Peterson, who talks about the lion diet, I think that she is right. I think beef is by far the superior food. I can really tell because I think obviously one becomes a lot more sensitive, you know, attuned to how one feels when you eat different foods. And there's no doubt in my mind that eating beef makes me feel best. Um, it really is the superfood. It really, it is. really is. It really is. And the, of course, the amazing thing is that right from the get go, um, when I started eating steaks, um, initially I was like overcooking them. Now I barely cook them at all. Sometimes it's like 15 seconds on each side. And I never have any problems digesting them. It's amazing so, to digest a, a beef. It's so yeah. it was such a it was such a story that we were given about the indigestibility of meat. And absolutely, I absolutely. Remember. And I bought it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. really believed it. I was so frightened of eating meat, you know. And actually, um, my friend Jamie, you know, was quite nervous on my behalf as well. And and he suggested that I should try having bone broth first before I introduce meat. Now the irony is it's bone broth that upsets me, not the, the meat. The histamine response. Yes, yes. And also, um, I obviously I've been watching your viewers are, might well be aware of a gentleman called Elliot Overton, who is a bit yeah. of an oxalate specialist. So I've, yeah. I've watched a lot of his videos. And of course he talks about how if you consume a lot of glycine and maybe you might be deficient of B vitamins, which I think I probably still am, you know, in an underlying sense, um, then you can end up endogenously producing your own oxalates. And I think that's definitely been the pattern for me because um, when I've had too much bone broth, it's really, really upset me. So, but I find I don't really need bone broth anyway. I get plenty of collagen because, you know, I, I chew my way through all this really tough, <laughs> gristle and and um, you know eat all the fat on the beef and you know, there's loads of loads of collagen in that why would you need bone broth are you eating eggs uh yes uh not that many though um i just don't feel as good when i eat eggs really uh so it's more of a kind of occasional convenience rather than a, a real staple of my diet um at the end of the day beef is best so yeah. why deviate from that really well let's um, talk a little bit about that transition again because yes, I know it, yes. was, it was kind of a struggle and i and i think people would be interested to yes about yes that yes. struggle when you all of a sudden are just eating beef yes what, what was happening for you then well firstly it was slightly disappointing because unlike <laughs> unlike 99 percent of people i actually put weight on which I think was Kaylee Hogan's experience as well. You're probably familiar with her, with her um, saga. Um, and having watched her before, I just, I just, you know, gave myself a bit of a talking to and decided I wasn't going to be too worried about it. But I gained weight, particularly around my middle, which I just had never had. I mean, I'd always been really kind of 
small, you know, around my midriff and so on. So that was a bit dispiriting, but I just put it in my teeth and decided, well, that was a small price to pay. Um, and actually, it's only really been the last few months that I've shed that weight around that, you know, the, the middle section. Um, and so there was that. And then there was the, the copper tax, which I described earlier on. And I, th I think it took a, well over a year before the oxalate dumping started. And apparently that is not unusual. You know, it takes a while for the body to actually think, oh, there are no oxalates coming in here. Now, you know, I can start shedding some of the some of the detritus. So I began dumping quite seriously. Um, uh, it would have been around about September, July, September last year. And I was getting all the classic kind of oxalate dumping symptoms. I was, I became terribly stiff and I've done masses of yoga for years and years and years and years. And I was, I was always very flexible. So this was, this was extremely dispiriting for me because my back seized up, you know, I was having difficulty walking even some days. Um, it was awful. And I was peeing oxalates, you know, see that burning feeling. And obviously they were coming out in my, the other the other way as well so i was getting all the associated discomfort and then of course i did a bit more research found out what i could do about it and i started taking calcium citrate which i'm sure a lot of your viewers will know is is fantastic at actually kind of mopping up the the oxalates and, and facilitating their expulsion from the body because of course calcium has a very high valence with oxalic acid so um, it was incredible that the symptoms of the oxalate dumping just kind of melted away over a few days, actually. Oh, just from, did yeah. you find the same, pat, the same kind of intermittent patterns? like with Yes, that? yes. So I'm still getting like the odd flare up, but because I'm taking the calcium citrate most days, it doesn't really ever get to the, as bad as it was last autumn. Um, so I'm, I'm keeping it in abeyance, but I think it's obviously still going on. I can tell. Yeah. Um, I think Sally, um, Sally Norton talks about years of yes. And she also mentioned, I remember that oxalates can weaponize, she used the word, um, <laughs> candida. Can weaponize. Yes, yes. And also candida will, will secrete oxalates as well. So there's a, it's a, it's a double whammy. Yeah. So. I mean, I don't know at what stage my candida completely went because, of course, it's impossible to tell. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's still some that get there, given the fact that I am still dumping oxalates and probably will be for a long time to come. Um, it, it doesn't seem, but whereas it was very, very dispiriting last autumn, now I feel like yeah, it's it's completely manageable and it's under control, and 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 also again just as happened with the copper dumping the oxalate dumping events are getting less severe and and further spaced out so there is a there is a there's a distinct improvement which i can actually point to so i'm yeah i just feel everything's on the up basically you know there isn't anything that's that's got worse that i'm actually worried about it's just it's just a matter of waiting it out i mean there are still some things that i have had long-term problems with that haven't really changed at all yet like for example nails i mean i could never grow my nails you know ever since i was a very small child they were they were they were weak and flaky and and they would grow very slowly now my mother who who was never as sick as i was now has lovely long glossy strong nails and that there's been a you know this definite improvement as a result of the diet i have not experienced that yet you know yeah, but yeah. you know i'm judging from what other people say i think it's fairly certain that it's just a little bit further down the road for me really you know i mean my i was i was suffering from such severe malnutrition it would be a bit odd if if more important things didn't get healed first really yeah um, because that's the way it goes isn't it your body can't do it all at once it has to prioritize Yes, layers and layers of death. layers and layers. Yeah, I mean, my nails are really not very important. I mean, look, we know that the brain has a way of hogging all the available nutrition that comes into the body, 
and I was always a very uh, top heavy person. All the energy was up here, all the activity up here. And, and it's funny, as you went down my body, there'd be progressively less and less vitality. <laughs> So, and, it, and therefore, I don't think it's any surprise that it was this area that really began to heal you know, the brain that I actually experienced the benefit from, you know, immediately. Yeah. Were you taking, are you been taking electrolytes? Do you? Um, I have a lot of salt. I mean, I just use salt like it's going out of fashion, you know, so, um, and we do, um, we use magnesium oil. So we make it ourselves out of uh, magnesium chloride flakes and, and distilled water. So it's dirt cheap. And then Sweet. just... Yes. Slather it all over the body, you know, and leave it on. And um and I but even that, I mean, you know, when we first went carnivore, I was having to use that sev you know, maybe once, twice a day, absolutely without fail. Otherwise I would become rapidly very deficient in magnesium because of course magnesium is so easily given up by the body you know whereas the body tends to hang on to calcium it relinquishes magnesium the drop of a hat so any kind of dumping that you're doing you will lose magnesium very very fast and i did so that was like my main concession to the kind of electrolyte requirement um i've i haven't taken anything like um uh, expensive kind of shop bought electrolytes or anything like that because I don't think those are necessary. My mother finds that I mean she doesn't eat anywhere near as much salt as, as you know I do because for me like part of the appeal of being carnivore was like finally being given to you know, the green light to eat the two things that I really like the most which is fat and salt you know but my mother's not such a salt baby so but she'll she'll have a spoonful of salt in her in her water if she gets cramp and it will go immediately. You know, just go to, it sort of underscores the fact that everyone really truly is different in the way that they've come to it in their own childhoods, like your mother's childhood and your childhood was very Yes, different. yes. Now, well, my mother, my mother, I always called myself, I'm the child of a runt who is the child of a runt because she was very sick, my mother, when, when, um, she was one of two twins and my mother was left in the womb. They didn't even know she was there. And they were in incubators when they were very young, my, my mother and her, her twin sister. Uh, my, my grandma had albumin poisoning when they were in the womb. And my mother was always sick as a child. She was very, very unwell. And, um, and then of course I came along and um, although I was not sick in my very early years, I then quite quickly became sick and I was always the sickest in the family out of the four of us. So there's this a, a generational pattern yeah. of ill health that actually needs to be um, reversed. And I think that's another reason why I have to be patient because it can be, and I, I mean, I, I have to admit there have been times because of course I read a lot of the accounts that people write on, on uh, Meet RX. The, these amazing testimonials that people give about their, their health transformation. And a little part of me in the last few years has been a little bit jealous from time to time because people talk as if as if all their health problems sometimes just disappear over the night and, and that has not been my experience okay well but, it sounds but, like uh, yours were so were so uh, comprehensive they were so deep was, from from early mm -hmm. childhood switching to vegetarianism so mm -hmm. i would think that there's just so many layers of healing going on yeah so many so many and it will take time and yeah, fortunately, as I said, I just, I mean, I've, I've always had a lot going on in my head, so I don't really focus on it that much, you know, because I think you, you just have to be patient and let your body do it for you. You can't force <laughs> anything. Um, are those some of the, co the, what do you tell people when you, what are the coaching tips that you, can you share with us some of your coaching Oh, tips? I think the importance of patience, actually, and just, understanding that your body has certain needs and if those needs have not been met then time and love and um careful nursing nurturing it is is what's appropriate and and not to be impatient with themselves you know um because i think because i i wrote on my blurb the fact that I'd had a different transition, that they so far have been the kind of people who, who I've attracted to, to speak to me in my coaching practice. So um, they come to me 
probably feeling a little bit kind of uh, dispirited by their their lack of a miraculous transformation or maybe they've had some miraculous transformations but it hasn't been quite as as um quite as miraculous as the next person you know, that they that they emulate you know so um because all these things are relative and of course the, the most important thing is to stress that everybody's journey as you just implied is different and there is no perfect transition probably not for anybody no, and, and it, things take time. It's, yes. it's really great it's, as long as you're going in the right direction. Yes, that's what matters. And I've never, ever felt any doubt about that. I mean, it would be, I mean I've had so many positive kind of, um, improvements you know, as a result of the last few years that you know, I would have to be extremely ungrateful you know, not to acknowledge those. You know, I mean, I it's, it's just given me back hope. I mean, I, I cannot, I could not be more grateful to people like, you know, Dr. Baker and Jordan Peterson. I mean, these these are my heroes, these people, because they they have stuck their neck out, necks out in a very hostile world. Because I, the main reason I wanted to be a coach was to combat the propaganda that gave me decades of sickness. Yes. yes. I can't think of a better reason, or really even any other reason. It, it, it's so important now. I mean, I'm I'm very much a person who is conscious of the power of the media and the power of the education system and the uh, what we might call the kind of military pharmaceutical kind of complex um, that has. Uh, a stranglehold on the narrative of what it means to be a healthy person and to have healthy habits and I think that um, I mean this is just one issue obviously we won't go into the others but this is one issue where I can't think of anything more important really I mean this is people's health it's their it's their survival of, of, of them and and their dear ones and people have been taught to poison each other we, yes we've all been hoodwinked yes so long yeah so long so long and yeah it's my duty it's my duty to do that and uh, to stick my neck out and actually be considered an eccentric idiot <laughs> how, how do you, are you <laughs> and my shoulders are broad i, I don't mind good for you <laughs> yeah are, how are you enjoying the meet our ex platform I think it's a great platform. I mean, I think okay, there's two there's elements I really like about it. Firstly, the testimonials I mentioned earlier, on, which is just a just a endless source of positivity. You know, so if I'm if I'm really a bit bored and downhearted, I'll have a good scroll through and, and see see who's new on the list because there's always more people, more and more people all the time. And um, and then of course the other thing is the research um, base all the articles that you know we can tap into because there is more and more and more and more data and there probably always was data but it wasn't collated so it wasn't at people's fingertips in the way that it is now um so i think that it's meet our ex the, the website is is the most terrific resource and we with yet another reason yet another reason to be grateful yeah nice Very <laughs> as nice. if we needed any more <laughs> Well, I am so um, happy for you and your whole family yes. that that you came to this diet because it sounds like it's helped the whole family. Oh, it really has. It really has. Incidentally, my sister also had the yellow thing going on. Jaundice. Yeah, yeah, which has also gone. Were you eating a lot of fruit? I just forgot to ask you. No. No, you weren't. I wasn't eating any fruit. Uh -huh. I stopped eating fruit around about 2000 and, ooh, about 2008, 2009. Long, long time ago. And even at that point, I wasn't eating that much. So it's just like, you know, getting rid of the final pieces. No, I, honestly, I, 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 I have lived the life of a maiden aunt. I'm not kidding. I, I've hardly drunk. I've hardly taken any pharmaceutical products at all. Um, not even aspirin, hardly ever. Um, no these, are, well, these are all good things that you avoided. Them. They are good things, and I think they saved me. I think they saved me. But of course, the the major piece in the puzzle was the was the plant. You know, the evils of plants. You know, yeah. and um, yeah, my God, whoever who knew, who knew? And I think that um, the sad thing is, 
that for so many years I thought I was doing all these good things and of course there was a kind of arrogant sense of smugness that came along with that I have to admit and um, the paradox was I was probably doing more harm to myself eating so many plants even not consuming these other things than the people <laughs> doing these things but not eating so many plants and eating meat I understand. So, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I, I saw it, something along these lines the other day. That it's actually probably worse to eat no meat and lots of sugar than it is to meet, eat no sugar and, and no meat. I, I understand. I, that's what I, you know, they talk about the sad diet, the standard American diet. And, mm. and I look at that now and think, well, you know, it's, it's still better than, than a vegan diet. Yeah. Even with all of its mass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Still better. What an indictment. Yeah, an indictment. <laughs> but, you know, I have to say, and this is probably, in a way, this is probably the most important thing for me. You know, this, this is not the only area in which I've changed my mind um, in the last few years. It's, it's been like a radical transformation in, in so many areas. So many of my dearest sacred cows have been slaughtered you know, mercilessly and I, I, I really love that. I actually love being wrong and changing my mind radically about things and, um, and in a way it feels kind of sad because I'm thinking well is that it now? Have I, have I run out of things to be wrong about? <laughs> Oh, I bet it keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you'll be that much stronger to and thinking that much clearer about everything that you yeah. can learn. Yes, yes, I think so. I think so. But it's great to change your mind. So I would kind of lay down the gauntlet to people who, you know, who might feel a little bit doubtful about taking the plunge. That actually, come on in. You know, the water's warm. Changing your mind is the best thing ever. <laughs> It brings so much great. happiness. You sound great and you look great. And Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, do you. so do you. So do you. So nice to meet you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm so glad you're here helping people with me. Right? It's a privilege for me. Thank you very much. Well, we'll see you, see you around soon, I hope. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.